uh, we are embarking on to part two of this series we've called For the People in the Back. Just a couple of things I want to make note of before I get into the content of my message today. Uh, first, as always, you can follow along in the YouVersion app. We have all of our sermon notes located there, so you can take notes, you can highlight scripture, you can follow along in a very real-time kind of way. Uh, just download the YouVersion app, and then in, the, in there you'll find events, and that will be where our sermon notes are at. Also, want to remind you, we're pushing pause on our year-long and multiple year-long venture through the Bible called The Story. And uh, so we'll pick that up in several weeks, uh, but we will be diligent to finish that uh, however long it takes us. Like I said, every now and then we'll push pause and jump into a kind of a one-off series. That's what this one's uh, doing right now for us. And then lastly, I want to mention that... Um, after Easter, the week after Easter for a few weeks, we're going we're gonna to journey through a series that I'm calling Living My Best Life. And, uh, and I'm, I want to walk through uh, some habits that if we implement them in our lives, some spiritual habits, that if we implement them in our lives, that we will find uh, blessing and peace and all of the things that I believe God has in store for us, kind of this, this um, life to the full. And so it's going to be a great practical series. Uh, it's a wonderful series to invite people to because I believe it'll have something each and every week that we can apply literally on Monday. And so uh, it's called Living Your Best Life, and I hope that you'll join us for those the weeks after Easter. Well, for the people in the back, I want to remind you, as I said last week, it's kind of this modern day saying that we see a lot on social media. Usually it comes up when somebody posts something that I agree with, and I want to draw attention to it. I want to make sure that people that are opposed maybe to the idea uh, that they have their attention drawn to it as well. And so, you know, say it a little louder for the people in the back or, or say it again for the people in the back. And the people in the back are often thought of as distracted, inattentive, and even tuned out. But what I've learned, what I've learned over time is that people in the back, those people that are in the back, those people that are missing the point perhaps, especially as it relates to things of Christianity, those people actually fall into one of two camps. And these two camps, I'll quickly describe them again for you as I did last week, but it's my hope in this sermon series that I can reach both of these groups, which is not easy to do in a singular sermon series, but I'm going to try to do it. The first of the camps uh, for people in the back are those that have been hurt, confused, isolated by the church. Because somehow there's been a belief perpetrated or an action that's happened or even some misuse or uh, misapplication of scripture. That's the first camp of people. They're kind of disillusioned to the church. They don't necessarily hate Christianity, but they just don't like the church any longer. The second people, the second group of people that I would put into a camp are those that are stuck in the rut of non-biblical, biased, and Americanized Christianity. Oftentimes people have picked this up, me included, from well-meaning but uninformed pastors and teachers. That's kind of our two camps of people, those that have been maybe somehow hurt or disillusioned and those that have been brought up in a way of teaching that's really not biblical at all. And again, my series is to hopefully reach both of these people. And what happens is actually people can fall into both categories. You can actually be hurt by the church, but also following unbiblical teaching. And sometimes that's actually how the hurt happens. But reaching both groups is critical. You all get this, right? Reaching both of those groups of people, it's critical. People are leaving church in droves. And my friends, it's our responsibility to offer Christianity that aligns with the Bible that mirrors the life of Jesus, and that puts aside all of our own prejudices and our own preferences. And I'll say it again, I said it last week, but people do not hate Christianity because of Christ. They hate Christianity because of Christians. And we've, for decades, me included, have created a version of Christianity that is simply our own ideas of what faith and God should be with a little Jesus sprinkled in here and there. We've got to correct this. We've got to correct this if we want to win people for Christ. And so last week, if you missed it, you can go and watch it on our YouTube channel. But last week, we covered this great big idea that God does not show favoritism. Do you remember that? God does not show favoritism. And we concluded together that because of that truth, all of us are his favorite. How about that? Isn't that great? All of us are his favorite. On our best days... And on our worst days, we concluded that he loves us just the same. 
And because he does not show favoritism, we, we must not either. We just can't do it. We cannot show favoritism. In fact, when we allow our prejudices and our preferences to drive our opinions of others and our love for others, it's sinning. It's sin. James tells us that, that when we show favoritism, we sin. And it's important that we grasp this very big idea that God does not show favoritism and that he loves us even on our worst day. It is important that we grasp that big idea because the rest of this series is contingent on us getting that fundamental part of God's character. And so today, if you'll allow me, I want to take a next step, another step for the people in the back. After we realize God's great love for us and for others, the natural next step for those of us who call ourselves Christians is this big topic of discipleship. Discipleship. And discipleship, just like last week's topic, it has been a hot topic over the years. Discipleship. Discipleship is simply the journey from where you are to where God wants you to be. Does that sound familiar? You see, we have as a mission statement here at the Journey Church that we want to lead people on the journey from where they are to where God wants them to be. That is discipleship. The ending place of our discipleship journey is to be like Christ. That is the finish line. That is the ultimate goal. And over the years, the capital C Church has been trying to grab a hold of what the best discipleship model is. And maybe you've been caught up in some of that thinking and uh, contemplating as well. In more recent years, I've got to kind of pull the cover off of one shift that I call exclusive discipleship. Exclusive discipleship. I promise I won't get too academic here today, but I'm terming it exclusive discipleship. And unlike inclusive discipleship... Exclusive discipleship attempts to make discipleship so complex and so complicated that only a few are truly able to reach the inner circle. And what ends up happening with exclusive discipleship is that you and I look down our noses at people who are not pursuing the high things of discipleship, like eschatology and soteriology. And pneumatology. Don't worry if you don't know what any of those mean. (laughs) I consider myself a pretty learned individual. This week, somebody actually called me a genius. (laughs) My wife witnessed it. She can tell you. But I am pursuing my doctoral degree. It doesn't make me smart by any means. But I've got to tell you, the more I learn about God, the more I learn about the Bible, the more I learn about Christian faith, the more I realize that it was never meant to be as complex as we try to make it out to be. And those of us who are pursuing understanding in all of the ologies are often doing, are often doing so at the expense of simple, basic commands of Jesus. Listen to me. Jesus never called any of us to figure it all out. He called us to follow him. It wasn't an endeavor of figuring anything out. It is an endeavor of following him. Matthew chapter 4 verse 19 is our verse for the day. And it's when Jesus simply says, come, follow me. Come, follow me. Not come and figure it out. Follow me. And can I just submit to you today that following Jesus is messy. Following Jesus is gritty. It is not easy, but it is the pursuit of anyone who bears the name of Jesus. Now, the word disciple, as we look at it in the Greek form in the New Testament, it's actually much better translated as apprentice. Discipleship is the word we hear used, but apprentice is a much better term than disciple or discipleship. Jesus is saying in this moment, come and apprentice with me. Come and apprentice with me. You see what happens is an apprentice is not just there 
with the person who is training them so they can acquire more knowledge. As important as knowledge may be to the apprentice, all of the time, all of the work, all of the investment, all of the following is supposed to be so that the apprentice can eventually do what the mentor does. So the, men, so the apprentice can do what the mentor does. Discipleship, in other words, is not measured by what we know. It's measured by what we do. This is some good teaching today. I hope you're buckled up and ready. Discipleship is not measured by what we know. It's measured by what we do. And Jesus says, follow me. Do as I do. Mimic me. Follow the leader. Do you remember the game growing up called Follow the Leader? Anybody remember that? You'd get in the line behind somebody and the person in the front of the line, they would do all kinds of silly walks or walk over a chair or duck down or anything like that. And all of the people behind them in line had to do as they did. How boring of a game would it be if we just followed the leader as they're acting silly, doing all that stuff, and we just simply are content saying, well, I know what they did. And we never mimic what they do. The life of following Jesus, the life of a Christian, is simply put to follow an apprentice after him. Here's my first point for today. You'll want to write this one down. Our love for God, ourselves, and others grows best in the soil of servanthood. Our love for God, ourselves, and others grows best in the soil of servanthood. Servanthood requires that we humble ourselves. Servanthood requires that we get out of our comfort zones. Servanthood at its truest point requires us to serve people who don't look, live, act, or think like us. And when we engage in real servanthood, our love for God, ourselves, and others will grow. The person who comes to church faithfully every Sunday but never serves misses out on a deeper love of God that is only available through our service to others. When we are serving others, we are better able to see the blessing of others by God. And listen to me. Everyone, everyone, everyone has a story, and every story matters. I have found myself over the last few years becoming a consumer of stories. I just love to sit with people and hear their story. I love, people that know me well will tell you that I love to ask questions. I just love to, love to dig in and get the story behind the story. I love the story of people. And listen to me, church, everybody has a story. The problem is, is that we don't take the time to hear everyone's story. And you see, stories are how we see moves of God in the lives of others. As we serve others and we listen intentionally with an open heart, we will quickly see these God stories that we wouldn't be privy to inside our comfort zones. We'll also find this deepened love for ourselves, won't we? When we serve others, we'll quickly find that all these barriers that we've built to self-love, they're somehow gone. I mean, it's not a quick fix. It's not universally 100% true all the time. But when we serve, we will find, and studies have found, that we are far happier in general. When we focus our lives outwardly versus inwardly, we'll find a sense of peace and satisfaction with life. It's one of our core values, discover your purpose. We believe that when each of us discover our purpose in life, that is when life to the full really begins. And, of course, our love for others will grow. When we engage in serving, it's, 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 it's when we hide behind that keyboard of our computer or isolate ourselves in our homes or confine ourselves to limited circles of people that we begin to have this jaded view of others. When we're out there serving, we will begin to see the humanity in others, especially those who are different than us. We'll see them as people. People who have needs and wants and hopes and dreams just like us. As we engage in homeless ministry, and I'll revisit this thought a little bit later, but as we engage more fully in homeless ministry, thank you to Daryl and Allison, and Tanya's not in the room, but thank you for all you're doing to get that ministry up and running. 
we're three months in now, and, and we ran out of food. Was that this week? Praise God. But let's not run out of food anymore, right? Yeah. Like, praise God, but let's get some more food. But, but one of the things that I was told early on was that the people we serve in homeless ministry are no different than me and you. They just don't have a home. And we all have issues. Theirs is they don't have a home. And as we get out from the comfort of our seats and these walls and we begin to interact with people who are living without a home, we'll begin to quickly see their humanity. We'll stop turning our heads when we see somebody standing on the corner with a cardboard sign. We'll begin to smile and make eye contact and learn their name. We'll begin to invite them to church. We may even give them a little money. How about that? When we see their humanity, we begin to treat them like people. And listen to me, that only happens when we get out of our comfort zones and begin serving people. People who are created in the image of God and people for whom Jesus died on the cross for. There's this beautiful moment in John chapter 13 that confused the disciples. It's during the Passover meal and it's just before Jesus' death and Jesus, he stands up and he begins this process of washing the disciples' feet. And there's this back and forth in this moment between Jesus and Peter and Peter says, no, 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 you can't wash my feet. And then then when he realized, okay, you're going to wash my feet, then you need to wash more. And Jesus says, no, I need to just wash your feet. And it's this beautiful yet confusing exchange. And once Jesus is done washing the disciples' feet, and yes, even Judas was in the room, the one who would betray him, he still washed his feet, And once he's done, Jesus says to the disciples, and I think he says to all of us today, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, he says, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And then he says these profound words, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you Do them. And we see this tension between simply knowing as a discipleship model and actually doing as the ultimate discipleship model. He doesn't say you will be blessed if you know them. He says you'll be blessed if you do them. He says you should do as I have done for you. And I love the picture of Jesus kneeling and washing the disciples' feet. You see, unlike my feet, who are, they're clean, free of sock fuzz, uh, the bottoms are well manicured and taken care of, (laughs) very soft to the touch, they're a little bit sweaty because preaching's hard, but unlike my feet... The disciples' feet were dirty. Of course, we probably all know they they wore sandals back in the day. They traveled around and their feet picked up dirt from where they had been. Noel and I didn't collaborate on this today, but he preached my message for me, so now it's time for the altar call. Following Jesus requires we get dirty. Following Jesus invites us to step into the mud. Following Jesus compels us to get real, to get messy, and intentionally walk where others would not walk. Discipleship, my friends, does not ask how clean your life is. It asks how dirty your feet are. does not ask how clean your life is. It asks how dirty 
your feet are. And too many of us have imagined that the call to follow Jesus is one of dress shoes and, and preacher sneakers. In reality, the call to follow Jesus is one that is off the beaten path. And it is littered with pain, trauma, poverty, injustice, and oppression. And as messy as the call of Jesus is, he promises us that if we will follow him, he will wash our feet. Oh, come on, somebody. If we will follow him, he will renew our strength. He will sustain us. He will protect us. He will guide us. He will cleanse us. He will reward us. He will provide for us. And as we pour into others, he will in turn pour into us. And so to close out today, I want to say the same idea three different ways. It's easy because you just have to write one down. You don't have to write all three. I hope that one of these, though, will pierce your heart. First is this, disciple making happens in the community, not the classroom. Disciple making happens in the community, not the classroom. Church, I love the church. I live for the church. Most of my week is taken up focused on the church, that bride of Christ. And I love Sunday mornings. I love to worship together with my church family. What not worship fire today? Woo, man, it was so good. I love those moments. I love to gather together and experience God in all the unique ways that we can only do gathered together like this. But Sunday mornings are not the way to be discipled. If you come in here expecting that you're going to find some discipleship pathway on Sunday mornings, you will leave disappointed. Additionally, Bible studies in small groups are not discipleship. Man, I'm out there today. It's okay. I'm sorry to say it, but they're great. They have their place. I believe in them. But I've seen time and time again people that faithfully attend Sunday morning services in midweek getting puffed up on knowledge and never doing anything that looks like following Jesus. It's nobody at this church, so don't worry. <laughs> A couple of great verses to consider that kind of reinforces that thought. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. The same is true for me and you. Just like Jesus, in order to truly have compassion on others, we have to see them. To truly have compassion, we have to see them. That means getting out from the pews and going to where they are. Not right this minute. Don't get up and leave. Faked compassion. Come on. We, we fake compassion sometimes, don't we? We can, we can admit that in church. We fake compassion, but fake compassion is not near as powerful and life-changing as realized compassion. That compassion that you see and you touch and you feel and you walk alongside and you get your feet dirty because you see that someone is hurting and helpless and harassed, that is the kind of compassion that leaves its mark on you, that changes you. It leaves a mark so deep that you see Love for God in a different way. You find love for yourself in a different way. You love others in this new and unique way. Realized compassion helps us know that people are hurting and in need of a Savior. Faked compassion will never do that for you. And if it just stops with knowing, we will miss the entire point. We are not changed in any profound way by an intellectual knowing. We are profoundly changed by a heart knowing. This knowing at the heart level where I have been in front of people who are hurting and helpless and harassed and I've connected with them heart to heart. That, my friends, is where life change happens and that comes best by seeing people where they are in their hurt, in their pain, in their poor decisions, yes, even in their dysfunction, in their dirt, mess, and sin, We've got to see them in order to have true compassion. Jesus' brother, he's going to speak to us several times today. Again, like last week, he reinforces this idea with a shocking Holy Spirit-inspired statement. He says, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. In other words, if you want to have a faith that is alive, do something. Serve others. Look at what Jesus did and do that. If you're wondering why your faith doesn't feel real and alive, 
Consider how and if you're serving others. It's really a simple equation, isn't it? How often we fail. Here's my second way of saying it. Sanctuaries are where the mission is taught. Serving is where the mission is lived. Again, I love Sunday mornings. None of you are going to come back next week, are you? I love Sunday mornings, but it cannot be our primary way of, of, of discipleship. Sanctuaries are where we come to get filled up. So we can go out and pour ourselves back out. It's our fill-up spot every week. It's a time to come and get fed so we can go out and feed others. It's a time to come and get a drink of the living water so that we can go out and give water to others. That's what the sanctuary is meant for. It's meant to come in and give glory and praise to our God to somehow get filled up again by His Spirit and go and fulfill the mission that He's called us all to. There's just one point in the life of Jesus where He was catching some shade uh, for healing people on the Sabbath. And the Pharisees, you see... What is true about the Pharisees is that they, they kind of set up some religious rules that had no biblical bearing to them. Uh, and so this moment that I'm about to unpack for you, it was one of those moments. And of course, Jesus, as he always does, he kind of flips it on his head. And Jesus, he, he would come regularly into the synagogue, into the sanctuary, and he would teach. We see this time and time again, but if we continue reading beyond the moment of teaching, we will also see that after every moment of teaching, Jesus would then go and he would heal somebody. He would go set somebody free. He would go and he would put some action with what he just taught to the people in the synagogue. And there's this moment where he did this, where he taught and then he healed someone. And then in, in, and all of his haters gathered around and they're like, shame on you. And he's like, what? Nah. And all that kind of stuff happens. And then this line, which I find so comforting, when he had said this, all his opponents were humiliated. But the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was saying. Nope. With all the wonderful things he was doing. They were delighted. His opponents were humiliated. Listen to me. Send in my notes. I'm going to carefully choose my words. If you want to humiliate those you perceive as an opponent, just do the work of Jesus. Let the ministry and mission of Jesus through you do the talking. You don't have to defend him. You don't have to talk ugly. You don't have to be angry and mean and all of that sort of stuff. You just have to live like Jesus and he'll do the humiliating. I don't know if that's biblical, but I think it is. They were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Not teaching, not saying, not instructing. All of the things he was doing. Follow me, he says, do as I do. And as we meet on Sunday mornings, I want us to keep in front of us the goal. Ephesians. So Christ himself gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service. What's the benefit? So that the body of Christ may be built up. Okay, but why? Why? So that we can reach unity in the faith and knowledge in the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Guess what? Those things that we do to equip each other through the week is meant to, or I mean on Sundays, is meant to impact our week. It's my goal to equip you each and every week to do the mission of Jesus and help all of us to follow him from the sanctuary to a life of service. It is his loftiest call for all of us. And then again, James speaks to us clearly. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I think this is one of the reasons so many people are leaving the church today. They have watched churches for decades who have listened to the word who have fought for the word to be preached, who have, dis who have fought for the word to display be displayed on government property, and they've imposed this word on others through legislation. But the same church that did all of that was also absent when it came to doing what the word said. I fumbled my words, but I want to say that line clearly. People that have left the church, at least as I've sat and talked with people, they've watched for decades... Churches who have listened to the word, 
fought for the word to be preached, fought for the word to be displayed on government property and imposed the word on others through legislation. But that same church that did all of that was also absent when it came to doing what the word says. So my last way of saying these same statement three different ways. God's will is not that you would come and sit, but that you would go and serve. God's will is not that you would come and sit, but that you would go and serve. I don't think I've ever taken my shoes and socks off for a sermon before, so count yourself blessed. (laughs) (laughs) Or cursed, I don't know which one. God's will is not that you would come and sit, but that you would go and serve. We've talked about it before, but consumerism has taken over the church. If we can be honest with each other, we love a good show. We love to get fired up and emotional. We love to be entertained and enlightened. We love to hear deep teaching. We love to listen to the most talented worship teams and hear the most charismatic preachers. We are great at coming and sitting. But that is not a life that follows Jesus. It's not a discipleship pattern. That is a way to have a dying faith and a dying church. No more coming and sitting, everybody. Let's go and serve. Let's go and serve. Let's go and serve. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus puts it this way. I hope you know this from art. Therefore, go. Go and make disciples of all nations. All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Guess what? That scripture is fulfilled not when we come and sit, but when we go and serve. He couldn't be clearer. He said, go, go, don't sit around, just go, serve, love, have compassion, heal, set free, go. And this is how we go, my friends, from being disciples to being disciple makers. And that is our next step in our journey, isn't it? That once we realize the idea that in order to grow in our maturity in Jesus Christ, it requires us to step into the gap of serving others. Once we get to that place in our lives, then it is our responsibility to multiply who we've become. It's time to begin tapping others and tapping into others so that we can train them up in the way that they should go, that we become mentors. Can I just say for a second, I don't think I've mentioned this yet. Uh, We have a young couples group that meets on Wednesday nights. Some of them are here today. It's a great group. We have a lot of fun. They let me and Consuela come. You know, she's been married to me almost 22 years. Isn't that crazy? Poor thing. We've been together for 25 years. That's a long time. It's over half my life. But we ask in this young couples group, how many of you have a marriage mentor? Somebody who's not family, that just walks alongside you in marriage, that you can ask questions of, that you can learn more about, that you can help resolve conflicts between the two of you. And out of the seven or eight couples that were there that night, I think we had two that had true marriage mentors. Two out of eight. My math ain't that good, but I think it's 25%. You guys are all calculating it right now, aren't you? Two, three, one out of four? Yeah, okay. And I would guess that if I asked the same question of all of you who are married in the room today, it would probably be the same percentage. And what is even sadder, if I ask you who is your Christianity mentor, who's that person that you meet with regularly that helps you wrestle with the things of faith? That helps you to arrive at conclusions and answers when you're faced with big decisions about family and kids and jobs. The person that helps you 
know how to apply what you're reading in Scripture? My guess would be it's an even lower percentage. I point that out to just simply say that, church, we need to be, we need more mentors. We need to find a way to be mentoring others, and we need to find our own mentors. And what I've found to be true in my own life is that mentors hardly ever say no. Someone that I've gone to and said, hey, would you mind being my mentor? Nine times out of ten, they don't say no. The only time people say no is if they have 20 other people they're mentoring at that time. Right? But many of us would say, you know, I don't have that person. I don't know who that person would be for me. And even if I did, I'd probably hate to bug them. We have to, we have to mentor one another. We have to. Again, it's not sufficient to just come here on a Sunday morning. I love what Noel said, go and take a picture with somebody you don't know. I was watching, some of you didn't do that. It's okay, we'll give you another chance. Right now, go, no. Uh, but what is true is how, it's, it's, it's a microcosm of how we live our lives, right? Like, I know what's best for me, but like taking that step of what's actually best for me, it feels uncomfortable, and I know there's probably a benefit, and I did it once, and it actually wasn't that bad, but I'm back in my cocoon again, and I don't want to get out of it, and I've made all those same excuses. You all need a Consuela in your life. She's the one that gets me out of the house when I just want to stay in bed. She's the one that reminds me of truth when I just want to listen to the lies in my head. She's the one that reminds me that being together is so much better than being apart. One last word of wisdom, and then worship team, you can come on back up. One last word of wisdom from Jesus' brother James. Sounds familiar. In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. In other words, it's not sufficient of any of us to just simply say we have faith. Faith that is alive is one that compels us to do something. It's one that inspires us to go. Faith that is alive is one that directs us to discover our purpose so that we can further God's mission here on earth. So you may be asking, Pastor, I'm on board. I hear you. I need to get involved. I need to do something. I've been a come and sitter. I'm ready to go and serve. Let me just rehearse some of the ways you can do that here at the Journey Church. Youth ministry is always looking for volunteers. But also we have our bi-weekly food pantry tomorrow. And uh, I posted a couple days ago, I think, or maybe yesterday, that we've got a few people who will be out of town, some of our regular Volunteers be out of town tomorrow. If you're at all able to serve, man, what a great way to jump in. We've had some new people. Some new people jump in and serve, and they've been like, wow, this is, this is easy and fulfilling, right, Julie? They love it. They love it. It's not, it's not hard work. You just got to show up. Imagine that. So we'll unload the truck. I mean, I guess there's some hard work there. We could use some muscles. So if you got muscles, show up tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., 9.30, 9.30 a.m. We'll unload the trailer usually have a couple skids worth of food to unload and Consuela and her wonderful team gets it all organized. Our guests will start coming back at 5 p.m. So we ask if you want to serve tomorrow night, just show up around 4.30 and uh, you'll help us distribute all the food that we got in the morning. Food pantry tomorrow. It's one way. Just show up. It's that easy. Youth ministry. It's another way. We got... We've got our homeless outreach that happens every Wednesday. Somewhat. Yeah. Okay. So we're at the tipping point with this ministry. We'll hit another one in a few more months. But we're at this, this tipping point of any new ministry that we start. 
It, 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 you, can, you can watch it. It happens. At about the three-month mark, excitement begins to wane. Like It's kind of like that bell curve, right? Like it, it peaks about halfway through and then about month three. And so if we don't, if we don't do something, then we'll continue to decline. And, uh, and so, you know, these two right here faithfully, faithfully serve every single week. They're the leaders of, of that ministry, and we're so thankful for them. They also have this core group of about four or five people, I would say, maybe six, that have been helping each and every week. But that's about it. And as I said when we first begun, it's not necessarily even the going out, although I want to see more people going out because they, they need that experience. At least once. Everybody should do that. At least once. But really it comes to preparing the meal and then package preparing it all so it can go out. And then, of course, we need supplies and other things that we just receive all the time. And so that's a great way to get involved. And guess what? You don't even have to cook. Just go to Chick-fil-A and get 30 or 40 meals. I can't cook, so that's what I would do. That's all right, right? They can do that. Yeah. And so if you want more information about that, after the service, just see one of them. We have an online sign-up form. I'd point you to it, but I don't have the link right now, so sorry. But they'll, they'll get you more information. And we need somebody this Wednesday to prepare food. No. In the future. So there you go. There you go. It's a great ministry. Great, great ministry. Ran out of food this week. The need is there, and the need is great. Easter Sunday is a great week to get involved. Right here on Sunday mornings. Our kids' ministry. Our kids' ministry is uh, adequate in staffing. We want to be better than adequate, especially for Easter Sunday. There'll be lots of kids. You're averaging about 40 kids in there, I think, upstairs. 30. And then, well, yeah, and then the other 10 or 11 are down here in the nursery and preschool. Aren't you guys thankful for Amanda leading our elementary ministry? Uh, with, with, with Josh and Carissa leaving, Consuela has temporarily taken over the preschool and nursery. And both of these ministries need more volunteers. If you're already serving, pick up an extra Sunday. Serve twice a month. If you're not serving in one of those, let's get the background check and let's get you trained. They'll provide all the training you need. Man, great ways to, to see God in serving. And this sermon isn't about serving here. It's just about living the life of Jesus. And if you serve because pastor told me to, you're going to get burned out. Don't do that. Find a place, because we're all gifted in different ways. Find a place that you love to serve. That you see that, that God's hand can move. Did you know? Did you know, did you know, that in the month of March, we sold almost $300 worth of coffee and breakfast goods out of our cafe? Woo! All of that money goes to missions. It goes to a missions park that is supported by our youth group called Speed the Light. When I was at the uh, event with Convoy of Hope this past week, all of their semis are paid for through Speed the Light. So when we send money in for Speed the Light, one of the things that they do, they provide uh, transportation and, and some sound equipment and stuff for missionaries. So every time you buy a cup of coffee, you're supporting a missionary. But guess what? They need more volunteers too. Especially for Easter, I would guess. Everybody needs more for Easter, right? But it's a great and growing ministry, which we have, we have grander vision for than what you're even seeing today. But we've got to, we, you know, Vision, vision goes ahead and then, and then everything else catches up, right? And there's many, many more. I'm sure somebody's going to be offended that I didn't mention their specific ministry. But there's many, many more ministries. Jesus says to us, come and follow me. He puts no caveats on what that means. He does not explain to us where that will take us. He does not say how dirty our feet will get. The follow me part is oozing with faith. 
because 15 years ago, I never would have thought I'd be on this platform talking to all of you right now. But because I chose to follow God, to follow Jesus wherever it took, it took me here. I'm so thankful that it did. I hope you share in that thankfulness. That's where the applause goes. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. Totally kidding. I'm the most humble guy you'll ever meet. But following Jesus requires faith. And it is not easy. It is definitely going to get you a little messy. Because people are messy. All of you are messy. You all know that, right? But I'm messy too. And so my one homework assignment for all of us is to find your way to following Jesus. Maybe in different ways than you've ever followed him before. Maybe in new ways. Maybe it's in ways where you thought, I would never do that. Often that's where he can use you in the greatest ways. Bow your heads with me if you would. Father, as I stand here shoeless, I'm reminded that your mission of following you takes this profound turn. That in all of the healing, all of the walking, all of the the storytelling, that at the end of your life, you live for us in vivid color the idea of dying for your brothers and sisters. And God, I am reminded right now that a life of following you is a life of death, of dying to self. That God, that the things that I place as a high priority often are not your priorities. The times when I step into ministry are often the times that are inconvenient and far messier than I ever imagined. The call to follow you is one that is full of mountaintop highs and valley lows. But you promise that you will be with us even to the end of the age. And so my prayer for all of us is simple. May we be measured not by the cleanliness of our lives, but by the dirtiness of our feet as we follow after you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Stand to your feet and let's worship him.
say it at the end of our prayers, we are agreeing with God in heaven that his will be done. And so to end our service today, before I give the blessing, can we all just say amen? Amen. One more time, amen. Amen. One more time, amen. 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 Now the blessing, yeah, give it up. Give it up for God. And now the blessing that sounds oddly like a song we just sang. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace as you follow him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great rest of your Sunday.